God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, tonight, I want to talk with you about self-government. Self-government, or should I say the battle for self-control. Over in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the text says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the text says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the text says that God literally scooped up dirt, <coughs> blew in the dirt, and man became a living soul. And then God gave man dominion over the earth. The problem that we have right now is it's very difficult to have dominion over the earth when you don't have dominion over the six feet of, of earth or dirt, if you will. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is self-government or self-control. We have two natures. We have the old nature. And that old nature wants things easy. It wants things quick. It wants things um, uh, now. And then we have the new nature. And the new nature, it wants what's right. It wants what's holy. It wants what's best. And so we're dealing with two natures, the old nature and the new nature. And God says now he's given us dominion over the earth, over the dirt, <laughs> if you will. But then we're made of dirt. But I submit to you tonight that if we don't have dominion over this six feet of dirt, we can't get dominion over the dirt that we walk up on. And so how do we as Christians maintain uh, self-control. How do we win the battle of self-control? Uh, the Apostle Paul, he dealt with this issue over in Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 15. And I'm going to read out of the NIV translation. Uh, verse 15, the text says, I do not understand what I do. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. He's saying, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Verse 17, Paul says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Verse 19, Paul says, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Verse 20, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Verse 21, Paul says, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Verse 23, Paul says, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, raging war against me, a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Paul is saying in essence that the things that he should do, he doesn't do. And the thing that he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing. So what Paul is saying in essence is that they, that he has a civil war going on within him. And the truth is, all of us have a civil war going on within us in some areas of our lives, including pastor. What does that mean? It simply means that those areas in our lives that we should have under control, that we don't have under control. There's areas in our lives that we struggle with, that we should have dominion over and have control over, but we still don't have complete control over those areas in our life. And so... The question has to be then, how do we get control 
of those areas in our lives that seem to dominate us. Some of us, it, it, it could be um, uh, lust. For, for others, it could be um, eating. For others, it could be some type of uh, drug um, addiction. For others, it could be a financial uh, challenge. For some of us, it could be um, uh, a mouse, not being able to control uh, what we say and control uh, gossip, if you will. For others, it could be um, um, issues in terms of um, uh, uh, getting control of procrastination or getting control of laziness where you know you procrastinate or you're, 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 you're slothful in some areas of your life. And so all of us are dealing with something. All of us are dealing with something. All of us have some type of area in our lives that we don't have control over. And we have to get control over those areas in our life. The, the answer or the key to this now is self-control, self-government, self-control. Meaning where you are able to govern yourself in these areas of your life that seem to be out of control is where you get control of those areas of your life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 through verse 25, the NIV translation, the text says this in verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, verse 23, gentleness and self-control. Against us there is no law. And so one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. And so if you are a born again believer, you have the ability to be able to have self-control because it's part of the fruit of the spirit. King James verse 23 reads like this, meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. So King James refers to self-control as temperance. And of course, temperance is self-control. Uh, the Greek meaning of self-control or temperance means to get a grip on. It literally, mean, it literally means to get your hands around something until you have it in control. It means to get your hands around something or on something until you are in control of it, if you will. It means balance. It means balance. Now watch this. Balance is the key to life. Balance is the key to life. You, there has to be balance in life if you're going to have victory and walk in the victory that you uh, desire to have. Now, see if I can give you some illustrations or some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, water. Um, we need water to survive. Uh, we need water to be able to um, sustain ourselves. But now watch this, too much water at one time and we can drown. So there has to be balance in terms of, of water, if you will. Um, let's take another one. Let's say uh, prescription medication. Uh, some of us take prescription medication to uh, deal with some type of infection or some type of issue that may be going on with us physically. But now too much medication and you can overdose and it can kill you. Uh, let's look at fire. We need fire to, um, to cook. We cook our, our, our meals, our dinners uh, using uh, the stove, using fire. But now fire out of control can burn your house down. And so there has to be control, there has to be restraint and there has to be balance in every area of our lives. And so self-control is about boundaries. There has to be boundaries. There has to be parameters in which we live our life by. Self-control is about parameters. It's about boundaries. Being able to know the limits. Being able to know when not to cross the line. Whenever to know, when, knowing when, uh, when to uh, uh, not proceed. Knowing when to quit. Knowing when not to cross over, if you will. 
First Peter chapter five, verse eight, the NIV translation. I like this translation because it says be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I love this translation because it tells us to be self-controlled and to be alert. And then it tells us the enemy and he identifies the enemy as the devil. It says that the devil is powering around, roaring like a, a lion looking for someone to devour. So what the text is saying is that the enemy, he can't get everybody, but he's looking at who he can get. And so the text says we ought to be self-controlled and alert because the enemy's out to get us. He's looking for those who are not self-controlled. He's looking for those who don't, uh, who are not walking in self-government, if you will. That he might pounce on them and take advantage of them. Um, a lot of believers are in trouble, even as I speak tonight, because of not bringing their lives under self-government, not allowing themselves to be self-controlled uh, in areas of their lives. Um, when self rules, stuff happens. <laughs> Let me say that again. When self rules, when you allow yourself to rule, you end up in a lot of trouble. That's what happened to, to Nineveh. I mean Nineveh. That's what happened to Jonah when he refused to go to Nineveh. He determined to rule that situation. He was under self-rule. He would not listen to God. And because he would not listen to God, he refused to go to Nineveh. And of course, when he refused to go to Nineveh, God dealt with him uh, in a very strong way. And so storms were allowed to come up into his life to get him back on track. And that's what happens when self rules, when we allow ourselves to rule ourselves and there's no self-government, if you will, there's no uh, self-control. We just let allow ourselves to just do what we want to do when we want to do it, knowing that there's parameters we should live by. But when we allow that to happen, then there are storms that arises in our life that causes all kinds of, of difficulty and trouble. And so now the question tonight in this teaching is what then is the key to living a self-controlled life? Scripturally speaking, what is the key to living a self-controlled life? How do we now bring ourselves to a place where we are walking in a, in a, in a disciplined way, in a way that is self-controlled? I'm going to give you three areas that I think uh, are three keys that I think are, are important for us tonight for, for self-control. And the first one is watch the weak areas in your life. Set a watch over the weak areas in your life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27, neither give place to the devil. We are not to give a door to the adversary to walk through to attack us. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give the enemy room to work in your life. Don't give him room to work his agenda in your life and in the life of your family. Now, the enemy, Satan, he goes after weak spots. He goes after weak spots. He knows your weak spots. He knows my weak spots. And if we don't watch those weak areas in our lives, the enemy here will walk right through the door in those areas of our lives and he'll take us down. So you have to be careful because those dark areas in your life will be your downfall. And what we try to do oftentimes is we try to cover up those dark areas, those weak areas, those blind spots that we know are there. And we try to cover them up. Uh, we try to keep them hid uh, from everybody, which is not a good thing. And especially we try to keep them hid from God. And of course we know we can't hide from God. You know, David says, where can I go and, 
and, and, and, and hide from you not being in your presence. But oftentimes we think that we can hide those weak areas in our lives and kind of cover them up and go on with life as usual as if everything is okay. And the reality is that it's those weak areas in your life that will bring you down. And so we have to make sure that we give attention to those dark areas of our life. You know, in Proverbs chapter 28, let me turn over there. Watch what the text says in Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. The text says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So the text says, if we try to cover our sins, we're not going to prosper. And that really is what happens when we don't watch over those weak areas in our lives. When we don't give attention to those weak areas. If you know that you have a, a weakness in your life, for, for example, let's just say that you're dealing with a pornography. Let's just say that uh, you have a uh, 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 a weakness in your life where you're struggling with pornography and you wait until everybody goes to sleep and you get on the computer and you start looking at uh, pornography and then you cover it back up and you start your day and go on about your business and you think no one knows. Well, you know about it and God knows about it and the devil knows about it and what's going to happen if you don't cover that weak area, if you don't get it covered, if you don't confess that sin and, and, and seek deliverance in that area, it's going to be exposed eventually. It's going to be found out eventually and it's going to be your downfall. Um, is, let's say you have a, a weakness in the area of uh, drinking. Let's say that uh, you struggle with, with alcohol and uh, you try to cover it up and you think that no one knows what's going on in that area or you think you have it under control when you know you don't have it under control. But you, you, you don't confess it to God because it, to you it's not a weakness. To you it's just something you do and you think you have it under control. But deep down you, you know when you don't have it under control. That's one thing about sin. We know when we don't really have it under control. We know when we're out of control. We do. We know that when we have an issue in our life that's out of control and we can't manage it. But pride sometimes won't let us confess that it's out of control or won't let us confess to other people that it's out of control because we like to think that we, you know, we, we have it all together. And the reality is we all are struggling with something. There's no perfect human being. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the blood. But if you have an area in your life that is a weak area and you don't confess that area and you don't try to get help in that area uh, it's going to manifest itself in a way that's not going to be beneficial to you. See sin is like rust. You know it may take a while for it to, to rust through and be seen but eventually it's going to be seen. People are going to see it. And, and so it's better to go ahead and get that area covered Confess that sin to God. Cover that weak area. Find you someone that you can trust, that you can talk to, your pastor friend or a leader in the church or a saint that you trust that you know is mature in the word that won't uh, reveal your, your, your weakness, won't talk about you behind your back or what have you, won't judge you. Find someone that you think that you can trust and, and get a partner uh, with, uh, with you, get someone to partner with you in that area so you can get some deliverance in that area. Um, there is no reason to be ashamed of sin. Sin can be dealt with if you confess it and get, get Christ, give Christ the opportunity to help you in the area of that, of that struggle. You can get some victory in it. Uh, I, I, I like to tell people, you know, you need to go ahead and, and tell it before the devil tells it. Just go ahead and just take the sting out of it and just tell it yourself. See, the devil, he likes to put folks in bondage. He likes to put folks under guilt and condemnation because he makes you think that, you know, you know, if somebody finds out about this, they're going to think less of you or, you, you know, you're not a spiritual person or, you know, you shouldn't be doing it because you're a Christian. And, and, and so he, he, he torments you 
and tries to make you think that you've got to keep that thing quiet. When in reality, you need to go ahead and tell the devil, you know what, I'm going to tell it before you tell it. Because I, trust me, he's going to tell it. Because he's, he's a liar and that's who he is. And so it's better for you to go ahead and watch them, those weak areas of your life. When you know there's a weak area in your life, go ahead and confess that thing to Christ. Go ahead and get uh, the word of God on that situation. Find you some help and get deliverance in that area. And move on. Get, get victory over that area in your life. And then... Uh, the second thing that we need to do if we're going to really live a self-controlled life is we need to prune away or cut away those things in our life that we need to stop. We need to cut away those things in our life that we need to stop. If you're going to get control and have a self-controlled life, you have to identify those areas that are in your life that are not beneficial, cut away those areas and recognize I need to stop doing this particular thing. My question to you tonight is, what's in your life this evening that you need to stop? What's going on in your life tonight that needs to come to an end? That you need to say, you know what, I need to stop doing this. This has to stop. What is it? What's in your life tonight that you know that you need to stop? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, let us strip away, strip off every weight that slows us down. And then it says, especially sin that so easily trips us up. So Hebrew 12 says that we are to get rid of the weight and get rid of sin. Those are two separate things. A weight is something that keeps us from getting closer to God keeps us from uh, having an intimate relationship with God that slows us down. A weight is something that hinders us in a walk. Let me put it that way. It's something that hinders us in terms of our relationship to Christ. And then it says sin. And sin is a, something that transgresses the word of God. And so we're dealing with two things. It says put, away, put aside weight and put aside sin. And so we have to, if we're going to get control of our lives and live lives that are controlled, self-controlled, we got to identify those areas in our life that we need to stop. What weight do we have in our lives tonight that we need to deal with? And what sin that is in our life tonight that we need to stop? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, the NIV translation the text says this. Paul says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So what Paul is saying is some things are not necessarily wrong in our lives. They're just not beneficial. And so just like we have sin that's wrong. And we know it's not beneficial. We need to cut that away. There are some things in our life that are not, not necessarily sin, but they're not beneficial. And so a good thing in your life can keep you from a God thing. And so we got to understand we need to cut away sin. <laughs> and we need to cut away those things that are good, but not God. A lot of times we struggle with good things at the cost of God things. And what we want, we want what's God. We don't, we don't want what's good. Or we should want what's God and not what's good. And so it's important for us to learn how to identify, okay, is this a good thing or is this a God thing? And a lot of times we get tripped up because we go for good at the benefit of God. And as a Christian, you want a God thing. You want what God wants you to have versus what is good for you. 
or should I say what you think is good for you. Now, Joshua chapter 7, verse 13, the NIV translation, this is about Achan. And of course, most of us know the story where Achan, he uh, hid some things in his tent. These were things that were uh, sacred to God. And Achan, he hid them in the tent and God dealt with him. And watch what the text says in Joshua chapter 7, verse 13, NIV translation. The text says, that which is devoted is among you. O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. Here's a situation where Joshua and Israel are going up against the enemy and they, they lose. They lose. They lose bad. And Joshua goes back and he's he's upset, man. He's 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 telling God, you know, why did you send us against the enemy? And we, we they're whooping up on our heads. And God told Joshua, he said, get up. Don't be praying to me. Get up. You've got sin in the camp. Go deal with the sin in the camp, because until you deal with the sin in the camp, you're not going to be able to deal with your enemies. And of course, Joshua finds out that it's Achan who has taken of those things that God said were sacred unto him and hid those things in his tent. And so I read that to say that not only must we put away and stop sin, but we also must identify those things that we are taking possession of that really belong to God. Some of us tonight, where we, we are covering our areas of weakness when it comes to sin, but we are, are, are not covering those areas in our life that we are, are vulnerable still in a walk because those areas are sacred to God and we have taken possession of those areas. For example, uh, to tithe. Some of us tonight, we have gotten away from tithing. We were tithing. We were giving of our, our tithe to God, but we've gotten away from that uh, because, you know, the pandemic, being out of church, uh, not being in the building, not being, you know, in a, in a structure. And so we just kind of gotten away from tithing like we know we should. We know that the tithe belongs to God. We know that the tithe is sacred unto God, but yet we have allowed ourselves to partake of that which belongs to God. And anytime we allow ourselves to take of that which belongs to God, there's going to be consequences for that. For some of us tonight, it's our gifts. We have gifts and anointings. God has anointed us. He has gifted us. And we have not utilized our gift for the kingdom of God in a long time. And of course, I know we have been um, um, in isolation due to this, this pandemic, but we're coming back together now. Uh, it's time to start thinking about, okay, how do I start utilizing my gift again for the body of Christ? Now that we're getting things back going again, if you, you may have a gift of teaching. How are you going to use, utilize that gift of teaching once again? Some of us, we have uh, the ability to be able to, to sing and to lead worship, but yet we leave it to three or four people to lead praise and worship. When we know we have a beautiful voice, we know we have a gift to sing. We know that God has anointed us to sing, yet we have not used our gifts in a long time to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. For some of us, we have the ability to, to be able to um, show hospitality, to be able to uh, loving the, the other saints as they come through, but yet we have not allowed ourselves to, to usher or to do anything for God. We've been holding back on the gift. Again, I know we've been in isolation, but we're back now. And what are you doing now with the gifts that God has blessed you with? What are you doing with the, the talent that God has blessed you with? You have to think about that because those gifts are not just for you. If you have a, a, a teaching gift, that, that teaching gift is not for you. God gave you that gift to be a blessing to the body of Christ. If you have a beautiful voice, God's given you that voice to be a blessing to the body of Christ. If you have the gift of prophecy, God has given you that gift to be uh, a, a, a blessing to the body of Christ. Whatever gift God has blessed you with, whatever gift God has bestowed upon you, it's not for you. It's not for you to enjoy just in your own uh, 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 boundaries of your home. No, guys, bless you with that gift 
for you to in turn turn around and be a blessing to the body of Christ. And so that gift is sacred unto God and unto the body of Christ. And so your time, some of us, we, we have not given God the time that uh, he's, he's, he's due. You know, we have not given him the devotional time. We have not given him the prayer time. We have not given him uh, time to, 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 to speak to us and to minister to us by ourselves. We spend all of our time making money. We spend all of our time uh, raising families and doing those things that we need to do. I get it. But what about the God? What about uh, the Lord? What about him being priority in our lives? For some of us, God has not received any of our time, any significant portion of our time, should I say, in a long time. And God expects us to spend time with him. And then the third thing is this, and we're talking about things we can do to get back self-control. The third thing is this, which is really key, in my opinion, that is, we have to learn to walk with Jesus. And by learning to walk with Jesus, we learn how to give up control. See, let me put it like this. We, we learn how to, to walk in self-control when we learn how to give up control to Jesus. By walking hand in hand, step by step with Jesus, we learn how to bring our lives under control. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus is speaking and he says this. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Verse 30, Jesus, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so if we're going to learn how to walk in self-control and, 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 and have self-control in our walk as Christians, we have to learn how to walk with Jesus where we learn how to give up control. The best way to be in self-control is to give up that control to Jesus Christ and walk with him. He says in verse 29, take my yoke up on you and learn of me. Now, the purpose of a yoke is to share and lighten a load. They would uh, take a yoke and they would put it on animals, some oxen or, or some cows, and they would yoke up. Normally it would be oxen. They would yoke up these oxen. They would take a young ox and a, and a, a mature yoke ox and they would yoke them together, put a yoke around their neck. And the young ox that's yoked to the older ox is learning as he walks by, side by side with the more older, with the more mature, older ox. And most of the weight would be on the older ox versus the younger ox. Jesus is saying in essence that I'm not going to put more on you than you can bear. In, in other words, I'm going to take some stuff off of you. If you learn to yoke up with me and walk with me, Jesus is saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take some stuff off of you and I'm going to take the burden of the yoke. I'm, I'm going to take the burden of the stuff that's on your life if you learn to walk with me. And so what Jesus is saying in essence is that if you learn to walk with me, you'll learn to give up control. And as you learn to give up control of areas of your life, that burden that you had in those areas of your life, Jesus said, I'm going to take that off of you if you just learn to walk with me. And so we learn how to get control of our lives by giving up control of our lives, if you will, and giving it over to Jesus. Now, a yoke is symbolic of two things. First is symbolic of partnership. Psalms 55, verse 22, the message translation, the text says, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. Here, carry your load and help you out. I love that translation. And so a yoke is about partnership. And so when I yoke up with Jesus, I become partners with Jesus and Jesus is going to take the heavier portion of anything I'm dealing with. And he's going to teach me how to 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 walk in those areas 
that tried to burden me down by walking with him. He's going to show me how to do it. And at the same time, he's going to take the burden of the, of the load on himself. And then the second thing is a yoke is symbolic of control. And again, you yoke a younger animal with a older animal. And the whole purpose is to show that younger animal which direction to take and how to go through uh, the process, teaching that younger uh, ox how to uh, go through the process or to how to handle the process that they're, 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 they're doing in terms of plowing. Now, when we yoke up with Jesus, it means that we move in, together with him in the same direction and at the same pace. Let me say that again. When you and I, when we yoke up with Jesus, it means that we move in the same direction with Jesus at the same pace. So if I'm yoked with Christ, then I don't have to worry about being yoked up to other stuff that doesn't benefit me. If I'm yoked up with Jesus, I'm going in the same direction that Jesus is going in. And I'm going at the same pace that Jesus is going in. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, the NIV translation, the text says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. I love that. He says, it, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, since we're supposed to be living a spiritual life, we need to be keeping in step with the Holy Spirit as we live this life out through the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 28, the message translation, the text says, our lives get in step with God and all others by letting him set the pace. I love that. It says, our lives get in step with God and all others by letting him set the pace. Who is setting the pace for your life tonight? Who are you allowing to be the pace setter? If you are a believer tonight, then Jesus should be the one that's setting the pace in your walk with him. He should be the, the pace setter, if you will. The problem that we have oftentimes as believers is that we're yoked up, but we're yoked up with so many other things other than Jesus, we get ourselves in trouble. Some of us, we're yoked up in wrong relationships. We're yoked up in financial trouble. We, we're yoked up in substance abuse. We're yoked up uh, in other areas that is not beneficial to us. And if we learn how to yoke up with Christ, yoke our lives up with Christ, where we're walking step in step with Jesus and letting him be the pace setter, it will free us up from those other areas that are uh, destructive in our lives. Some of us, we're making decisions that are destructive to us. We're, we're doing things that are destructive to us. We are uh, um, allowing our flesh to be in control in areas of our lives that are very self-destructive. Self-destructive behavior is not good. And no matter how much you might think, well, I can handle this, I have this under control, it's going to be okay, and God forgive me. Yeah, he will forgive you, but are you still controlling those areas of your life that you know are self-destructive? And the enemy's going to take advantage of those areas. The enemy, he knows what you can handle. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're doing. He knows what I'm doing. I mean, if I'm doing something in the corner, in the back, in the booth, in the dark, the enemy knows. If you're doing something in the corner, in the back, in the booth, in the dark, the enemy knows. He knows exactly what you have your hands uh, in. And so I, I'm saying simply that we need to allow ourselves to come out of those areas and yoke up with Jesus and allow Jesus now to, to, to move us along where we can get out of those areas that are not beneficial to us. He says in verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus says, learn of me. Learn of me. The only way for you and I to learn the ways of God is to see to it that we yoke up with God and let God be the pace setter 
of our lives. And by yoking up with God, meaning walk step in step with Him, doing the Word of God, obeying the Word of God, and allowing the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to guide us, and to help us in those areas of weaknesses where we need help in. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24, as I get ready to close out this teaching, a Living Bible Translation, the text says, Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that's happening along the way? Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that is happening along the way? This text is saying that since God and since we are allowing God to order our steps and direct our steps, then we can let go of trying to be in control. We can let go of trying to figure it out, but we can just continue to allow ourselves to be led and directed by the Lord, by way of the Holy Spirit and His Word. And by doing so, that will give us balance and give us uh, the ability to get our lives back under control by giving control over to the Lord and over to the Holy Spirit. God wants us to live a balanced, self-controlled life. A balanced, self-controlled life. Life is about balance. The key to life is about balance. The key to the Christian walk is about balance. It's about allowing yourself to yield to the Holy Spirit, to come under the the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to control your walk before God. And the way that happens is by yoking up with the Lord. And what does that mean? It simply means you walk hand in hand with the Lord according to His Word. You do what the Word says. You abide by Scripture in every area of your life and allow the Holy Spirit now to help you in those areas to take the, the heavy load off of you and to figure out what needs to happen in those areas and you can put complete trust on the Word of God and on, and on the Lord as you walk through those areas of your life that you struggle with that you don't understand. Some of us tonight, we're struggling in some areas of our lives and we're trying to cover it up. We're trying to, we're trying to handle some things and we're not doing very well. And that is because it wasn't meant for you to handle those areas. It's meant for you to yield those areas over to the Lord and bring those areas under control by giving control over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can do this. It's not as complicated as it sounds. It's very simple. It's very easy. You say, well, Pastor Doug, how do we do this? You do it by faith. By faith, you just do what the Word of God says do in those areas of your life. If you're struggling in finances, you need to tithe. Some of us tonight are really struggling in our finances, but you have taken control of your finances. And by taking control of your finances, you're doing things your way. You're not tithing. You're not um, uh, releasing offerings like you should. And so you're struggling. Surrender that control back over to the Lord by surrendering back to the Word. Some of us, we are struggling in our relationships, and that's because we're trying to do things our way in our relationships, in our marriages, in our relationships with our children and, and other people. When you need to just go back to the Word and just do it the way the Word says do it. The Word works. And one thing about the Word of God, you don't have to figure out how to do certain things in your, in your life. Just do what the Word says do. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's one thing about being a believer when it comes to getting victory in our lives. And that's just simply, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to figure this thing out. We just simply have to obey. We just simply have to obey what the Lord says do. When we obey what He says do, we get victory. When Jonah decided to obey the Lord and come out of that self-government mindset, where he just wanted to do things his way, when he made up in his mind that he was going to do it the Lord's way, the storm ceased. Some of us tonight, we need to just go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to stop trying to be in control. 
let God be in control so my life can come under control and get the victory that I need. It's that simple. It's really that simple. So I want to challenge you tonight to really look at your walk before God. And if there are some areas in your life that you know are getting out of control or that are out of control, be honest. Go before God, acknowledge uh, your part in uh, that area of your life where you have not surrendered control or you have been disobedient to the word. Acknowledge that before God. By acknowledging, I mean repenting of uh, your, your part in that area of your life. Ask the Lord to step in and to give you the assistance that you need. And then take your hands off of it. And then you just do what the Word of God says do, and then you trust God. I promise you, if you do that, you'll see victory. I promise you, if you do that, you'll see God move supernaturally in your situation. Now, for some of you, it may, it may not happen overnight, but you got to realize you didn't get into the mess overnight. It took you a while to get into that, that, that mess. And so you, it, you need to give God time to get you out of it. But you have to start. You need to start and get to that place where you say, okay, God, I'm going to get my life back under control by giving control back to you that you might guide me through this area of my life or these areas of my life so I can get some victory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity to share in your word. Father, we thank you for the people of God. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in their lives. And Lord, I pray for those, Lord, who are struggling in their lives with self-control. Father, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know what we need assistance with. And so, Father, I pray that as the people of God, as they uh, make a decision, Lord, to uh, surrender their their lives over to you in whatever area that they're struggling with, God. As they let go of that area, Father God, we're asking for you to take control of that area and for you to give them the victory that they so desperately need in that area of their lives. And Father, we thank you by faith that it's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to ministering to you Sunday morning. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Amen. I pray that you were blessed by that word. Amen. Well, it is now offering time, an opportunity for us to bless our Lord and our worship our Lord and our giving. Amen. And we have three ways in which you can give to Harvest Rain Church. You can give via text or you can go online and give that way. And or you can uh, mail your offering in and that address is on your screen. Over in uh, Matthew 10, 42. It reads, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Man, I can honestly say, uh, without any hesitation or reservation, that folks who are generous are usually blessed folks. I've, I've known numerous countless folks who give liberally, I mean, give without hesitation to others, and they are tremendously blessed. And that, that's, a, that's a law, that's a principle. However you want to receive it, it's a fact. I mean, I mean uh, it, it's said not only inside the church, whatever you sow, you shall receive. Um, but outside these four walls, it, 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 it is said too. Uh, folks who are philanthropic, who give uh, generous to like schools and various charities are blessed folks. And me, I consider myself a work in progress. Uh, Pastor Jackson uh, did a sermon some time ago uh, that we uh, that was on the on the screen uh, called a work in progress. So call, consider me WIP whip, whereby I am still uh, God is still working on me, and uh, I can make up my mind uh, that I'm going to sow or give someone a certain amount. And by the time it comes time to uh, give them that gift, it's been reduced. <laughs> so. Uh, kids, grandkids, whatever. It might have been 100, might have been 50, but by the time it actually reached their hand, trust me, it went through a filter. <laughs> hey, Amen. But God, the Bible says, for those who give generously, they will receive generously. So I board you, I, I, I challenge you, I ask you to sow into the kingdom. I mean, if you love God, if you want to see his kingdom advance, sow into his kingdom and watch God bless you. Hey, amen. Now, if you prepared in your hearts, in your minds or have you prepared your offering to give you can stretch your hand toward the screen or you can lift it up and we're going to pray for it amen 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that word that went forth this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all those who are under the sound of my voice. Dear God, we thank you that I would pray that they were blessed as a result of listening. I pray, dear God, and thank you for those who have sown into the kingdom. I thank you for their obedience. I thank you for their sacrifice, dear God. I pray with this offering, dear God. I pray a special blessing for the sower, dear God. I pray that you will meet them at their point of need, hear their prayers, hear their cries, dear God. I pray that they lack no good thing in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray that harvest rain, as a result, is able to do all that you call them to do, dear God. The lives will be touched. Souls will be saved, dear God, as a result of the obedience and sacrifice of others, dear God. I thank you and we praise you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you again for tuning in. I pray to ask that you tune in next time. But until then, you be blessed. Amen.